Hello there, Eric here, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about the melding of technology and culture. And living in Japan and coming from America, I'd like to talk about something specific, and it's called the Galapagos Syndrome. And this is a term to come out of Japan, and it's a great example to tell us what kind of influences culture has on the development of new technologies, how we adopt technologies, how culture has an influence about how accepting we are of new technologies, and how we'd like to change them for the specific use in our society and culture. So what is the Galapagos Syndrome? Well, like I said before, it's a term to come out of Japan. In Japan, we call it gara kei in many, many instances, gara from Galapagos and K meaning type. So it comes also from the Charles Darwinian uh, evolutionary model, which was uh, mainly conceived in his venture, adventures in the Galapagos Islands. And just like in his theory, there is a tree of life in which uh, many offshoots of uh, evolution changes and adapts to make new, create new uh, species. He noticed that in, more specifically, the finches in the Galapagos Islands that evolved to meet the needs of the specific islands or regions in the Galapagos Island. And this is marvelous uh, segue to how technology has been designed for specific use in a culture or society, just like these finches have evolved to meld well in their specific environments and surroundings in the Galapagos Islands. So Wikipedia calls the Galapagos Syndrome a term of Japanese origin, which has to do with an isolated branch of technology development. Uh, Japan has traditionally been a little um, cut off, a little xenophobic, and a little uh, unaccepting of large-scale outside influence in their structured society. And because of that, their development of technology has been either adopted differently or changed or has grown differently to fit the needs of Japanese unique culture and society. So Galapagos just as the finches in the separate Galapagos Islands evolve differently, some technologies have been developed differently or adopted differently to fit the needs of Japanese society. One of the first examples I can mention of this is the first westernized department store that came to Japan in the early 1900s called the Mitsukoshi Department Store. It's still in Tokyo uh, now you can visit this store. Um, one of the fir to, first stores to import a lot of Western type goods, very popular in this time. But the store itself was built on traditional tatami mat flooring. And if you're not familiar with tatami mat, it's basically straw woven flooring. Uh, it's very comfortable to walk on, but it doesn't do well with dirt. So that is why in many houses in Japan, you must take off your shoes before entering. Um, one reason because of this, this, the need for this type of flooring is the crowded nature of Japanese households and the need to use the same room for multiple purposes. Um, a tatami mat is a standard size all over Japan. And if you went hunting for an apartment or a house anywhere in Japan, it would you would be listed the rooms in in terms of how many tatami mats fit in that room. And one tatami mat usually is about the size of a twin size bed, and is meant to be able to have one person sleep at night. So, for example, in these closets here, there's probably a bunch of folded up futons. In the day, it's clear you can use it for 
purposes during the day of relaxing, exercising, whatever. And at night, you would pull out the futons and lay them down on the tatami floor and sleep very comfortably. But this doesn't do well with Western furniture, uh, especially rolling chairs or um, things that would leave indents, things, heavy things, heavy tables, just don't do well on this type of floor. Uh, it's meant to be a multi-purpose room. So this became an issue at the Mitsukoshi department store, putting uh, displays on the tatami. But more importantly than that, there is a famous story of a bunch of shoes going missing because there were hundreds of people coming to this department store every day and they would have to check their shoes, just like uh, checking your coat in a cloakroom. And one day, hundreds of shoes went missing or misplaced. So this is a, an example of how the Western need and Western development of culture and the Japanese styles sort of came in conflict. Of course, now all department stores, all major stores in Japan have uh, tile or wood or concrete flooring to house a more Western style uh, sales and environment. Probably the most pronounced and most popular is the Gara K phones, the Galapagos style phones. Um, the image in a lot of Western people, especially before the era of smartphones, was that Japan was way ahead in the phone market. Um, when they, this is mainly true. Um, a lot of these phones came out way before they were um, in the States, and they had their own specific type of technology. For example, a lot of these phones had one segment uh, transmitter receivers on them, transmitter receivers on them, so you can receive broadcast television, watch broadcast television and radio. Um, they had their own text messaging systems before uh, texting was a thing with smartphones in the States. But because this became uh, came fast and uh, these flip style phones were very popular even before the introduction of smartphones and it started to meet the needs and was adopted on a large scale format, the switch over became a little bit, uh, have found some little bit opposition to. So even now a lot of my colleagues still have these flip style phones and they can't receive um, text messages from popular apps like, I don't know, Inst Facebook Instant Messenger, things like that. So they're cut off from a lot of um, social interactions because of they're on these Galapagos-style islands with their phones. But uh, the younger generation has already adopted smartphones in a big way. Um, I take a census here at the university every year and two years ago was the first year we had 100% adoption of smartphones of all incoming freshmen. Uh, the year before that was only one or two Garaki phone adopters by young ch kids. It's um, If you don't have a, a smartphone you won't be able to communicate on the ways that young people are communicating with now. So you don't want to be stuck on the Galapagos Islands when you want to communicate I'm sorry, excuse me, with your friends. Now, because of this Garake type phone, it kind of pushed over to the way uh, homepage and web design was made. Um, because these Garake phones needed a specific text on their phones, um, web design took a slightly different approach than a lot of Western style web design, especially even now, it's very hard to find a fluid, responsive web design where it's made for the mobile and smartphone first and the PC as an afterthought. That was because for the Garake phones, you needed a separate text-based low uh, data usage design. And it was completely different. You just usually have to have two different sites. So this is taken, a great example is the Lakuten uh, company here in Japan. There are Japan's Amazon and they're trying very hard to compete globally 
and they are struggling very hard with adopting a new web design that is accepted more internationally. Uh, this Backwood 10 is a good example of the cultural clashes as well in the corporate world and corporate culture because Backwood 10 is, like I said before, trying very hard to compete in a global environment. And so they adopted policies, company policies, like an English only um, intercommunicate inter uh, company communication policy that was supposed to go into effect I think three years ago now where all communication was supposed to be in English uh, they're very having a very hard time keeping that policy um, a reality so that that's a another reason why it's kind of you see this branch right um, the Gata K phones came first uh, they were adopted widely, and this now influenced web design as well. You can also see this in social media and how it's adopted. Uh, in another channel, I'm sorry, on another video on this channel, you can see the comparison between America and Japan as far as thinking about uh, Hosted's cultural dimensions. And one of these dimensions is the acceptance of ambiguity how a society, how a culture um, is tolerant of not having things planned out precisely, how they're tolerant of um, ambiguity. And Western cultures, specifically in the United States and Japan, are on opposite poles of this di cultural dimension. And Japan, as I, at, as I think of it, one of the reasons for this is Japan's high rate of natural disasters. So this has kind of instilled the need for strict, very thought out planning to uh, save lives, basically, in the case of large scale uh, disaster. And we see this in social media as well. Uh, up until about 2011, late almost 2012, the most popular social media website was something called Mixi, and something I joined when I came to Japan in 2003. And Mixi is an example of this cultural dimension and the use of technology, acceptance of technology as well. And this was almost a gotake situation as far as the design of a social media site. Uh, Mixi was invite only, so it, you ha would have to know somebody already in the network to send you an invitation to join it. Um, it you, could, you didn't need to use your real name. You 95% or more of the profile pictures in Mixi were not your real face. They were a picture of a stuffed animal or a landscape or such. So you kept a level of um, security as far as keeping your identity safe and because this was only by invite uh, and you joined, joined groups and that was only accepted by people that would accept you into those groups this was a very good way for fit I'm sorry a good fit for Japanese society as far as uh, being safe in a new electronic environment and being able to control your own uh, identity but as Facebook started to creep in, um, the global usage of social media, using your own name, your full name, using your all your real life pictures, started to trickle into Japan. Um, there was a kind of a critical mass situation where enough of your friends were on Facebook and sharing their real information where you felt safe enough to do it as well. And uh, the kind of, again, the, the adoption of it was slow, but as soon as it hit that critical mass, it blew up in a large fashion. And around that time when it was getting really popular, uh, there were popular programs on TV and books and magazines about how to use Facebook in a safe way, how to protect yourself. Um, and there was... Every, every week or so, there was a new scandal where peop, someone might uh, get swindled by some sort of international type um, of uh, identity theft or whatnot. 
very small incidences, but big scale on news in Japan. So very good um, example of the Galapagos situation happening in social media and adoption of new technologies. And we can even see this today. Um, Japan and its creation and selling of cars. And this is something, I, I own one of these, it's called a K-car. Um, K stands for compact. So right now, and for the, for the longest time, the top selling cars in Japan are either compact or hybrid cars. And if you would compare this list to something where I'm from in Arizona, it would be completely different. This list would be filled with large SUVs and pickup trucks where I'm from. And you, they just wouldn't be practical here in Japan because of the narrow roads, because of the premium on parking spaces, uh, because of the, um, the price of gas, the hybrid and compact cars are seen as a way to go. I bought my compact car brand new for $10,000 US six years ago, and I've been completely happy with it. And I'm sold on the idea of compact cars now too, actually. So that even is something happening today. And you'll never, you won't ever see these cars being sold in the States. And I've gone to companies like Daihatsu and Honda to tour their factories and, uh, they all say the same thing, is that these cars will never be really sold in the States, uh, but they might be popular in other Asian countries. So that is the Galapagos Syndrome, uh, kind of in a nutshell. So can you think of any instances where technology and the development of that technology has been influenced by the society, by culture enough to make it different enough to be noticeable? Do you notice any other examples between the Western world and Japan as far as design of technology? If you do, please uh, let me know in the comments below. All right, this is Eric. We'll see you next time.